Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning to all of you, all of us. Thank you for inviting me to the forum again. Uh, at least it forces me to think all the time about the future. I can never relax. Every year I have to think about the future. The topic, the topic of my presentation is the new geoeconomics reshaping the future of the GMS. It's about new geoeconomics. So I'll go right to the point, what I mean by the new geoeconomics. That is my interpretation. To me, new geoeconomics, relevant to us in GMS, is about the rise of China. About the rise of China to be as dominant as the US and more than Japan. And more than Japan, I emphasize which were most dominant in the early 1990s when the ADB initiated the idea of GMS. So we must admit the fact that uh, the GMS idea came from ADB and US and Japan were dominant at ADB. New geoeconomics, another definition here, is about the high economic growth of the CLMV. Cambodia, Laos, Laos, Vietnam, and Myanmar, and Vietnam. The CLMV countries, together with Yunnan and Guangxi, when in the early 1990s, their poverty rates were high while the degrees of commercialization were relatively low. How would these new geoeconomics affect the GMS? I think we can think back to the time when the ADB initiated the setting up of the GMS in 1991-92. I think Jean Pierre was involved in that. Obviously, it was in response to the end of the Cold War with the disintegration of the Soviet Union, very timely. That was when President Gorbachev of Russia, you may remember him, he's a man with the, the global map on his forehead. That, that was how he was born with that map. He announced the policies of Glasnost and Perestroika, promoting the practice of market economy. At that time, Lao PDR and Vietnam, which were close to the Soviet Union, also supported market economy. Some of you might recall how close they were to the Soviet Union. When we had a meeting at that time, when they did not want me to understand, they spoke among themselves in the Soviet uh, language, in the Russian language. Cambodia was still in the midst of political settling down, but also tried to practice market economy. And Myanmar was busy with political repositioning after the quote and unquote unsuccessful. I have to do that quote and unquote because I don't know what it means by being unsuccessful in, in Myanmar. The unsuccessful general election of 1990. Nonetheless, Myanmar was interested in participating in the GMS scheme. The ADB GMS scheme focused on the construction of physical infrastructure to facilitate contact among the people of the GMS, financing would come partly from the ADB, which has strong backing from the US and Japan. Then New Zealand and Thailand initiated the setting up of the Mekong Institute in 1996. This is the one that organized this conference. Focusing on training on the practice of market economy they did not know how to trade at the time. And infrastructure project development, they did not know how to do project appraisal at the time. At that time, I personally felt that we needed to also focus on institutional issues to facilitate trade and investment. So when I became the Minister of Commerce of Thailand in 1996 and 1997, I hosted the first GMS ministerial retreat in Pattaya, Thailand. We had our meetings among the ministers and our staff without ADB officials 
and any other outsiders. I recall some of the participants at the time, still alive, David Ebo from Myanmar. I checked the other day, he's still alive. He's looking quite good. Another one was John Prasit from Cambodia. You know, he's still very much alive. And maybe now Deputy Prime Minister. We had very good meeting, but two observations I'd like to make. One was about security. I requested some security for our conference. The security people sent 80 security men, 80, a zero. I did not know what they were afraid of. But what it meant was that, as far as our GMS was concerned, at the time, security was number one. Security was number one. Today, we had all these meetings, no security people. The second interesting observation was entertainment. I took the delegates to see Tiffany show. The Chinese were so mesmerized by these male-female dancers. They could never imagine how male could be female. If they had known, they would not be complained so much about their you know, limited number of females in the country. That time, there was no Chinese tourists in Thailand, practically none. Last year, we had about 9 million, and this year more. You see the change of time. And this the Tiffany show has become so perfect. The latest I saw them, they look better than <laughs> before, much better than before. They could not, we could not even tell different whether they are male or female. So maybe we are expert on that. And maybe TSEP would want to consider organizing conference on transgenderization. I think you may have a lot of audience to come. Now, since that time, GMS has flourished. Yunnan and Guangxi have achieved middle income status similar to Thailand. I have been visiting these uh, places many times. I have seen the improvement and differences. Now, uh, Vietnam, I was in Vietnam a few weeks ago, I definitely taken off, followed by Cambodia. I'm going to Cambodia in the next two weeks. Lao PDR has gradually fulfilled the status of being the battery of Asia. Now with the electricity producing capacity of about 6.4 thousand megawatts as of 2017, and this number is rising. When I was Minister of Energy, opened this uh, new facility in Hong Sa, the coal-fired power plant in Lao PDR, supplying electricity to Thailand and, and Lao PDR. And Myanmar has achieved a political system that has been endorsed by the West. So together with economic reform, Myanmar is entering the economic taking off phase. Today, I'm having a meeting with a developer property developer from Myanmar this evening about a big project in Yangon that was not imagined 20 years ago. So in the meantime, China has emerged to become the economic leader of Asia. China announces its intention in the policy strategy of One Belt, One Road. Fully supported financially, by the establishment of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. There's no hiding about this, very open. At the same time, at the same time, the US has in indicated that it would not want to play the leading role of global level in many areas, including security, global warming, and ODA. The U.S. even wants to complain, I emphasize, about its trade deficit with small economies such as Thailand and Vietnam. I met a delegation from the U.S. two months ago exactly on that subject. Why did they have deficit with Thailand? Why do we have surplus with the U.S.? That complaint. How would this new geoeconomics affect us, GMS? In fact, much of the changes that have been taking place, particularly within GMS, have been well perceived by the GMS 
and have been reflected in the priority areas and issues worked on by the Mekong Institute. The present strategic plan of MI, this is for MI advertisement, for the period 2016 to 2020, clearly shows that GMS has come a long way. But of course, we still a long way to go. Number one, GMS has moved from subsistence agriculture to commercial agriculture. Trade and investment facilitation are in response to the growing demand for intra-GMS business. This is number two. Number three, innovation and technological connectivity are to make the best use of the new digital and power technology and to enhance GMS logistics. What was not well perceived was the very, very rapid rise of China. Very, very rapid rise of China. Last six months, I went to China three times. Every trip, surprise, surprise, surprise. Even me, I was surprised. Number one, rapid rise of China. And the policy and predictability of the US, especially after Donald Trump, became the US president from January 2017. I was surprised also about how he behaved after being president from January 2017. I thought he would change, but he has not. Do we need to be more prepared for the rapid rise of China and the continuing unpredictability of the US? As I said, I had hoped that unpredictability would stop, but it has not. First, on the rise of China, which is being reflected in the implementation of the One Belt, One Road strategy. I believe this will transform the GMS in a very significant way. Preview can be seen from the infrastructure development in China in the last 20 years. Mr. Li Hong was so kind to invite me to visit China, big city, Beijing, middle city, Tianjin, small city, Yangzhou, for one week. The infrastructure was perfect. So that was a preview for us about infrastructure initiated by China. So rather than responding to China initiatives, I think GMS should take a proactive role in the scheme. The China initiated connectivity is different from ADB initiated connectivity. So a good example is how to cooperate with China in the infrastructure projects such as the inter-country railroads. Lao PDR and China negotiated for some time. Thailand and China negotiated for three years. Just sign the agreement. There must be a lot behind the door, you know, what they were negotiating, what problem they had. How did they come to the agreement? And after agreeing, how did the people, how the people respond? We do not want to have any bad feeling when we have these projects. So, for us, GMS, we have as member two provinces of China. Therefore, identifying projects and programs of GMS in the One Bell, One Road scheme should not be so difficult because we have Yunnan and Guangxi with us here. Attempts should also be made on how best to implement these projects and programs. We are about to implement it now how best to implement these projects and programs. And as China is a policy leader on this connectivity, the expectation of the people, this is for the Chinese audience, the expectation of the people is for China to share a proportionately larger cost of the scheme. That is a complaint in Thailand about the road, the railway at the moment. Another area is the upgrading of human resources on a larger scale so that GMAs would have the workforce that would be able to support development at higher level. The importation of Chinese experts is a major issue in Thailand also. The training of trainers for skill development would serve this purpose. That's about China rising. What is more difficult is the issues about policy and predictability of the U.S. 
Vietnam has already had to adjust its trade policy following the U.S. withdrawal from TPP. I was in Hanoi attending an EPEC event. The subject was about without TPP, what do we do? About RCEP, about EPEC, and so on. And now the U.S. has even withdrawn from the most comprehensive global agreement on climate change and global warming. How would this affect the standard norm on environmental protection? The issue is so very important in the GMS development. This, in fact, can be viewed as a threat to globalization in a wider sense. Many other subjects as mentioned by Executive Director earlier. Apart from the economic and environmental issues, there are also political implications of the U.S. policy on the Middle East and the Korean Peninsula. It's understandable that the U.S. and others want to eradicate and minimize terrorism in the name and the form of ISIS, but the results have been the spread of terrorism activities even to the Philippines. We certainly do not want to see this happen in the GMS. This will require us to work harder and faster for the development of the GMS. We must not allow conflict to start, to begin. In the case of the Korean Peninsula, whatever is happening there has implications on the South China Sea and hence relationship among the GMS countries. The new geoeconomics introduced new challenges for the GMS for us. In retrospect, we should be pleased that we have the GMS, for otherwise, we would not have gained as much, so much from globalization and regional cooperation. I'm about to end my note. As it seems at present that globalization trend is being adjusted by powerful countries such as the US, it's pertinent for us to enhance our regional cooperation in economic and social areas starting from the sub-regional level of the GMS, where we have been focusing, now extending to the re at regional level of ASEAN, and extending to all of East, South, Central, and West Asia. So for us, from now on, in the future, from now on into the future, GMS agenda is not just about GMS. Now is the time for GMS to extend its agenda to the whole of ASEAN and to the whole of Asia. Now, this no sounds like I am inviting you to go back to history, go back to the future, to the time when China, during the Yuan Dynasty, about the year 1200, 1400, that signal means that I should shut up. Back to the future, to the time in the China Yuan Dynasty, 1200 to 1400 about, established the mainland Silk Road. And when China, during the Ming Dynasty, from about 1400 to about 1600, established the Maritime Silk Road. Also at the same time, when the Mughal Empire of India, from about 1500, flourished, enhancing the Persian Empire. All that ended when the West came increasingly from 1600. So the agenda for us is how do we go back to the future? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.